Hey, good morning and welcome to Journey Church. If we've not met, my name's Eric and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. Would you do me a favor and put your hands together one more time for those joining us online. God bless you guys. Thank you to the online community that's here today. So as Pastor Adam shared, we're concluding our I Told You So series today. It's a series where if you're here for the first time, we really focused on prophecy that has been fulfilled and looking forward to prophecy that is yet to be fulfilled. I hope you're convinced, for those of you who have been here through the course of this series, that if God prophesied it, that it will come to pass, right? Come on, right? So if I were to give you the Cliff's Notes version for just one moment, um, all of prophecy past is history, right? His story, right? All of prophecy that is yet to come will one day be fulfilled, right? If you missed any of these messages, I would encourage you to go to our website, journeychurch.org, or also go online to our app where you could download them, but also use those as a tool. Share them with others with the hope that they too may show up one day and come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Can I get an amen to that one, right? So today, I'm really going to get back to basics. I'm going to preach on some fundamentals of Christianity, a little bit of Christianity 101 that's important for all of us to remember. But before I do, I want to let you dream for a moment. If you were to get to go on a trip of a lifetime, what would that be for you? Where would you go? Would it be somewhere in the mountains? Would it be on the beaches of Bali? Would it be on the mountaintops in the Swiss Alps or touring the countrysides of Europe? Where might that be? Tyler, where would yours be? Whoa. That'd be a scary place to go. Maldives. Uh, did you hear that boy say again? Come on, Jesus. What is up with that? Maybe it's walking on the same streets Jesus did in Jerusalem. You know, not long ago, Mary Jo and I got to go on a trip with some good friends and we went to Scotland and Ireland. And one of the things I realized is that if you're getting ready to go on a vacation, it is a job unto itself, right? There's a lot of things you have to do, especially if you're going to plan that trip of a lifetime. You have to think about where you're going to go. In the old days, we would read brochures. For you modern people, maybe you've got some of those Apple Vision goggles that you could put on and do a virtual experience of where you're getting ready to go. I haven't got to do that just yet, but maybe one day that'll be something that we get to do. If you're going overseas, you gotta make sure you got your passport intact, right? You gotta check the date, is it about to expire? You gotta start to pack and man, you better make sure you're not over that 50 pound limit or all hell is gonna break loose when you get there to that counter, right? You got to go, and once you plan it, you got to buy the tickets to the different things that you're going to do and go and see. You got to have your hotel tickets, maybe. You got to have uh, your, your tickets for the rental car that you might be getting. You got to have your airline tickets that you're going to need to get there. And all of this stuff has to be in order before that date that you get ready to go, right? You need all your stuff in order, or guess what? When you get there, that trip of a lifetime is going to turn into a nightmare, right? It's not going to be all that you were hoping for. When you arrive at the airport, you have to weigh that luggage one more time just before you get in there. You have to pass through the dreaded TSA. Did you all make it through the TSA? You survived, you got through there, right? On arrival at your destination, you have to go through customs and border control. And if you pass all of these things, then you get to go on that trip of a lifetime. You get to enjoy the hotel. You get to enjoy the countryside. You get to enjoy the beach or the mountains or wherever it was that you were seeking to go. May our trips of a lifetime not turn into a nightmare. I use this as an analogy that I want to share with you as part of the things that we're going to talk about today. I'll bring it back up along the way. But before we do, why don't we pray? Father, I thank you for this day and what a joy it was to be in your presence this morning. To celebrate as people were baptized, to join with parents as they dedicated their children unto you, to worship with other believers and lift up the name of Jesus. Scripture tells us that when you died before you rose again, the temple veil was rent in two, that we could have direct access to God the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ. And today I ask you, O oh Lord, to rip that temple veil from our hearts that we could see you so clearly. 
Would you give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and power to put your word into practice in our everyday life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. As I've gotten older, I've realized that there are a few certainties in life. One of those is change, right? Have you ever noticed that as much as we like for things to say the same, they always start to change? Even today, I think Stephen's in the back. Steve, we're going to miss you, brother. Stephen's getting ready to go, and I know you're going to pray for him in second service. We thank you for your faithfulness to this family here at Journey Church, and we commend you as you get ready to go serving God on your next adventure. Another one of those is taxes. Oh, my goodness. Death, taxes, and change. Death is the one we don't like to think about all that much, though, do we? Maybe when you're younger, I don't recall thinking about it all that much. Maybe it's something we want to put it off in our, on our minds and we don't think about it. Um, the other day, I got a very interesting call, though. Somebody called me up and um, they caught me slightly off guard and I answered the phone. It was a number that I didn't recognize. And uh, one of the congregants was on the phone and she began the conversation by saying, this is going to sound really weird, but I almost died. I'm like, okay. That's an interesting way to start a conversation. But to her, it was acute. It was something that she had just experienced. And believe it or not, it was something that I could relate to. I had been through that experience a couple of years ago. And it changed a lot about my thinking and my mindset and, and the way that I view the world. Before that, I didn't think about death. But it's a reality that every single human being must face, right? One day, we need to come to grips with the fact that we're going to die that we are mortal, and that there's a trip that we're going to take in the spirit after that to one of two destinations, and that's what I really want to talk about today. There's one that leads to the new heaven and the new earth, and another one that leads sadly to a place called hell and eternal separation from God. And sometimes we like to push those thoughts out of our mind, but let me tell you, it's a great reality that we all need to think about. And there could be either great joy in that moment, or sadly, as the Bible describes it, weeping and gnashing of teeth. I always like to talk about the bad stuff first because it makes the good stuff all the more better when you get to it, right? James 4.14 reminds us that life is but a vapor. Think about that for a moment. Maybe let that reality set in for just a moment. Maybe you tried to put those thoughts away, but as you sit here today, as some of those pastors of old might have shared with you, do you, are you certain that you know where you're going to go after you die? Are you certain of that fact? If not, I hope that by the end of the time that we talk today, you will be certain of where you're going. Thinking that life is but a vapor can be terrifying in the natural, right? It can be terrifying. Think about that. It still brings me some fear, and I know where I'm going, right? But the Bible does tell us in John 3, 16, one of the most famous verses of all Scripture, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have eternal life. Do you believe that today? Only a few of you. I see a few heads shaking. Maybe you're still thinking about the other stuff I told you to think about, right? But there's good news in that. It says eternal life. That verse captures the essence of the gospel, that you were created being, right? That you fell, all of humanity fell, that Jesus came to rescue us, that one day he is coming again to make all things right and new, and that one day you will live in that glorified body in the new Jerusalem for all eternity. You want to talk about a trip for a lifetime, we better start to prepare now for that, even as you did this morning, because you know what you're going to be doing a lot there? Worshiping like you did this morning, or worshiping like I hope you'll be doing on Saturday night here, right? Or worshiping as I hope you'll do with other believers out there in Orange Park on Thursday night as we pray for our country, our city, our nation. Come on, Jesus. That's what life is all about. But if we break down that verse just a little bit more, he's reminding us that our bodies are mortal, but our spirits are eternal. So prophetically speaking, after our physical body dies, there is that trip that we are going to take in the spirit, right? And that's what we're going to talk about today. When you go on a plane trip, you have to pass through the TSA. 
Sometimes if you're going on an international trip, you gotta go through customs and border control, and it's never any fun. They inspect your bags. They inspect you. They make you run through one of those magnetometer type things or whatever it is they make you walk through. They might even ask you what the purpose of your trip is. And even though I know I'm doing nothing wrong, I always get a little bit nervous when I'm walking up to those gates. How about you? How about when the cop is driving behind you? I haven't done drugs in 25, 30 years, so to speak, right? But every time a cop gets behind me, I start to get all nervous and I'll start to freak out that I'm going to jail when they pull me over, even though I'm doing nothing wrong, right? And maybe life's a little bit like that too. Maybe as Christians, we walk through it and we say that we have this assurance, but then you start to think about those jokes of the pearly gate, right? And you get there and they're going to start to ask you some questions of whether you should get in or not. And you're still a little bit nervous. Well, maybe we'll get some more reassurances today about that before we get there. Hallelujah, Jesus, right? See, the Bible does tell us that there's a coming day where we'll face Um, a TSA, so to speak, which determines our future citizenship, whether that is in heaven or hell. It's a great reality that we all must come to cope with. And to get through there, we have to get through a narrow lane. It's almost as if uh, you can get there, though, with confidence if you know you've got the TSA pre-check. Anybody pre-check people in here? Do you know what I'm talking about? You know, you don't have to take off your shoes anymore. You can keep your belt on. You can be a little bit more reassured when you're walking through those lines. There's a big, long line waiting over here, but usually you can get through that narrow one just a little bit faster, a little bit easier. There's a scripture verse where the Bible admonishes everyone who will listen to this to take heed, but also uh, remember Matthew 7, 13 through 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. My heart weighs heavy even as I listen to that. As I look at the state of our society today, man, it it weighs heavy on my heart with all the things that you see. It seems that there's a great acceleration And I was prompted even to preach on that, but I think God led me back to these basics because they matter more than anything that we see out there going on. All the madness that you see out there going on right now, it pales in comparison to what we're talking about here today. And it didn't start now, it started long ago with the sin in people's hearts. I can remember being at sleepaway camp, Jewish camp in in, uh, North Carolina, right? We'd go there for the summer. My parents would send us there. And I was about 11 or 12 years old the first time I heard the song by Ozzy Osbourne, Highway to Hell. I was like, these Jewish kids are all here. They're preparing to get their bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah and they're here afterwards in the camp thing singing Highway to Hell. What the heck is going on here? And we'd laugh about it and we'd sing the lyrics along with it because it sounded good to the ears for some reason, right? But Ozzy Osbourne, you know, before going out solo on his own, led a band that was called Black Sabbath before that. And these songs that they had even in the 60s and 70s were mocking Jesus, mocking Christianity, mocking the things that we hold so dear. And we wonder why things continue to progress and get even worse in this generation, right? These things are not new. They're as old as time. The devil is still a liar. The demons are still at work out there on the planet trying to make things worse and worse and worse before Jesus returns, right? But we as believers, that means the light needs to get lighter. We need to walk that narrow path. We need to exhibit our faith with great confidence as we walk out there into the world that surrounds us, right? I pray for men like Ozzy Osbourne knowing that if he doesn't repent, the reality is he's going to have to live out his own lyrics and it isn't going to be some party in hell. It's not going to be one. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23 that we don't have to be an all-out Satan worshiper. It says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's a guilty verdict hanging over our heads. We're living lives alienated from God and on the highway to hell. All of us apart from Jesus. You can't buy a ticket out of it on your own. You can't talk your way out of it. 
We're riding a crazy train into destruction until we come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And one day, all of us truly will be faced with that moment where we get to the gates of heaven and then God's going to say, why should I get in? And there's only one answer that's going to matter. It's not anything that you or I ever did. It's that Jesus is the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that my sins might be forgiven. I believe on your son, the one true savior of the world, Jesus Christ. The one who died that I might have life. The one who is the embodiment of all prophecy of which it was pointing to him. All of it, it is because of your son, not because of anything that we could ever do. There's a set of verses that I read at pretty much every going home service that I ever do. It's an encouragement for those who are clothed in Christ and a bit of warning for those who are not. It's found in 2 Corinthians 5.1. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house that is made with hands eternal in the heavens. For this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall be found naked, we shall not be found naked, for we who are in this tent grown, being burdened not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed by God, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared for us this very thing is God, who has also given us the Spirit as a guarantee. For those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ, there's this longing in our heart to be with God in heaven. It's in there deep. We get glimpses of it on mornings like this when we're worshiping God together with other believers. There's something special that happens. You feel a nearness with God when you're in community with other believers, right? We know that this world is not our home. Our citizenship is in a different place. Our citizenship is in heaven, not here on earth. And then when we see the sins of this world taking over, it gives us this uncomfortable feeling, right? This isn't where I was created to be. This is not where God's called me to be, but we do have a mission while we're here. I'll share that in just a moment, right? If you're already a believer, there's some stuff that we should be doing. If you're not a believer, I pray that today you will come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that you'll surrender your life to him. But he's saying that one day we will be clothed with Christ and be with him in the heavenly places. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 is one that gives the believer great confidence. So we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we will be absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. The whole series that Adam's going to be doing next is about being in the presence of the Lord. How can you draw near to him while you're here? We get glimpses of that here on earth as we've shared a couple of times already this morning. But this gives me great confidence knowing that to be absent from this earthly body means that I will be in the very presence of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and get to worship him for all eternity. Having gone through what I've gone through and having many other people in here who have had experiences where maybe your health has failed you but you're still here, there is some nagging stuff in the back of your head that you know that one day death is around the corner. There could be healthy expressions of that and there could be unhealthy expressions of that. There's moments of fear in the natural, but I don't fear dying if I'm honest with you. I fear like going back into the hospital and being on a vent again. Those are the things that scare me more than dying. Man, to be dead would mean that I would be in the presence of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I don't want this earthly garbage, right? But to be with him will be what all of us long to be, read of this earthly habitation. You know, age has a way of helping you prepare for this. Those of us who are like over 50 and maybe 60 or 70, when our bodies start to fail us just a little bit, you've got to, be, to get old, you better be tough. Come on, Jesus. I mean, you wake up, your back be hurting, your hair be going away, but then it's growing in places where you don't want it to grow anymore. It hurts to get up out of bed, right? But there's a reality. I think God created it that way that we start to prepare for what is to come. 
Hallelujah, Jesus. But when we read verses like that, it reminds me of other things. Like Paul said in other scripture, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, death, where it, it's not there anymore. We know that one day we'll be with him. So what do we do while we're still living? 2 Corinthians 5, 9. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him, to live a life that is pleasing to the King of kings and Lord of lords, to pick up your cross daily and follow hard after him. For we must all appear before the TSA, the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things that are done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we pers persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I also trust that we are known to or in our consciousness. I share these things to you with a great weight in my spirit as Paul did having pastored for many, many years and knowing that destinies are held in the balance. That when those pastors of old would say, you know, tomorrow is not guaranteed, there is a reality in the fact that tomorrow is not guaranteed. Whether you're here in person or watching us online, there comes that moment of decision where you have to say, Jesus, you are who you say you are or not and deny the faith, right? There comes that moment for all of us. And man, when we have that confidence of knowing who he is and walking that out, oh my gosh, Lord, you are an amazing God who loves us and died that we might be with you. But in there, we also find this warning about sin, right? It says that we are called to live a life that is well-pleasing to him. That's for the believer and unbeliever. For the unbeliever, it is unto eternal judgment. For the believer, yes, your sins might be forgiven, but we're not just looking to buy a ticket into heaven or get a ticket out of hell. It says they will be given rewards for the things that they have done or challenges for the things that they have not done, right? What it says in scripture there. Man, I want to store up some rewards that I can lay right back at his feet as an act of worship. That's the kind of life that we're called to live. So how are you living, believer, in the midst of, are, are we just complaining that the world is falling to hell all around us? Or how are we living to make a difference in the lives of others? Are you living your life to make a difference in the lives of others, or have we bought into what the world says and we're living lives for ourselves? We can make a big change. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But I'm compelled to share these things with you as Paul was. I'm putting verse 11 into practice, knowing that the horrors of hell should compel all of us to do everything that we can to see everyone that we love come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. When we get to the end of the service and nobody gives their life to Jesus Christ, my heart cringes. Because in some way, I can't help but think there's a responsibility on all of us to say, I need to get someone here who doesn't know Jesus. I need to get someone here to, know, to help somebody come to know Jesus. That these gatherings are not just for us as believers to come and worship. Yes, that's part of it. We want to worship our God and King and lift Him up. But if we ever forget the importance of going out there and sharing our faith and spreading the good news, man, it's over. And the opposition does a darn good job of it. May we always be mindful that there are those who don't know him that we would live our lives to make a difference in the lives of others in Jesus' mighty and glorious name. May we be a little like Paul, a little crazy, a little beside ourselves. 2 Corinthians 5, 13, for if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. That he who died for all, that those who live shall no longer live for themselves, but live for him who died for them and rose again. If you're looking to find purpose in your life, live your life to make a difference in the lives of others in Jesus' mighty and glorious name. And you will never, ever, ever go wrong. May we live our lives to make a difference in the lives of others. Here's one of my favorite parts, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. 
Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. You're a new creation. You don't have to worry about when you get pulled over anymore. Hallelujah, Jesus. You don't have drugs in your car anymore. You're not drunk when you're driving down the street. Hallelujah, Jesus. You're going to get past it. You're going to be okay. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are from God who has reconciled himself to us through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. And it was committed to us the word of reconciliation. Let's stop right there. Does that say you should be fighting on Facebook with everybody about theological issues all the time? If your ministry is fighting with others on Facebook about ministry all the time, that is not a great ministry. It says that we should be reconcilers, right? That we should seek to reconcile. For if we go out there and squabble amongst ourselves on social media, is that not a, if you're an unbeliever watching that, why in the heck would you ever want to become a believer? May we be reconcilers. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, that through God we are pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. You know, if you look at the movies, you look at how law works, you know ambassadors, even if they do minor um, crimes while they're in the other country, like tickets, and some of them abuse these kinds of things, they're not charged with any of it. They're not guilty because they're ambassadors of the other nation. In the same way, yes, as times, Christians are going to have some minor infractions, right? We're going to do some things, but you are forgiven in Christ Jesus. It's no license to go on sinning, right? But he is to transform us from glory to glory that we might look more like him. But we are part of his family. Our citizenship is in heaven. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. May we live our lives as reconcilers, as ambassadors, as champions for Christ, as we try to expand the citizenship of the kingdom. Hallelujah. Let me close out this series with a little bit of a glimpse of what we have to look forward to as we get to heaven. You talked about your dream vacation. Here's mine. I'm just looking for an eternal vacation. Hallelujah, Jesus, where I could worship him and live the life that he's called me to do. But here's your travel brochure. Revelation 21. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away, and he has made all things new. Christians, that is your destination. Skip down to verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain, and he showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like the most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. One day we're going to be inhabitants of the new Jerusalem, right? Man, if we get to visit it here, hallelujah, Jesus, that is awesome. But one day you're going to get to see it in all of its splendor. Isn't it amazing how all eyes are upon the current Jerusalem, right? Everybody in the world is keeping their eyes on that place for one day. The King of kings and Lord of lords will inhabit it for all eternity. Last set of verses. Revelation 21, 22. But I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need for the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of the Lord illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth shall bring glory and honor to it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day, and guess what? There will be no night there, and they shall bring the glory, the honor of the nations to it, but there shall be by no means anything that enters it that 
that shall defile or cause an abomination or a lie, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So I ask you today, is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Are you sure that your name is written there? The Bible gives us some ways of knowing. It says in Romans, if you'll believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be what? Oh, there's some believers up in here. Hallelujah, Jesus, right? Believe in your heart and confess with your mouth and you shall be saved. And when you do that, all things begin to start to be new. The old you starts to fade away. God begins to sanctify you and transform you. And you're called to live for him. You're called to expand the kingdom of God. You're called to share your faith with others. You're called to be a living and walking testimony of what God has done in your life. You're a bearer of the image of the king of kings and lord of lords. You're his ambassador. You're supposed to represent him well, believers, right? So if you're a believer in this place, I want to encourage you and challenge you to live that out. Live it out everywhere you're at, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, with your hobbies, in and through the church, in the Starbucks, wherever you find yourself, will you be an ambassador for Jesus Christ? Will you practically do it? I know a lot of people are going to the serve team fair a little bit later today. They've made commitments. They said, we're gonna serve right here inside the walls of the church. And I hope for all of us who would not only be inside the walls of the church, but outside the walls of the church. That's why I always love National Day of Prayer. You get out there somewhere like the town of Orange Park and you stand there and watch all the cars drive by and you go praise the King of Kings and Lord of Lords out there in public. We need more of that today. We need more people out there sharing their faith boldly declaring whose they are and walking the narrow road so that others can see it. That's the life you're called to live. You don't look like you're excited about it though for some reason. You look like you're nervous about it. Don't be looking like you're on life support here. Hallelujah Jesus, right? See, there is a reality that one day all of us are gonna get that call of somebody else and their life situation's changed. Or one day you're going to have to make that call and you might find yourself in a hospital or find yourself somewhere else. Are you going to walk into that situation with fear in your heart? Are you going to walk into that situation knowing that you've already got the TSA pre-check that you're ready to go if it's your time to go? Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment? Lord, we joke about these matters sometimes because maybe the reality of them is a little bit hard to bear. Lord, as we read these words, if there's moments of conviction in our heart about the sins that are ongoing in our life, Lord, would you bring those to our remembrance this very moment in such a way that does not bring condemnation but brings repentance? that we gather before you today as believers and maybe some who are not yet believers say, Jesus, you truly are the son of God who died on a cross and rose again that I might have life. And I want every confidence and reassurance knowing that one day this earthly tent will go away and I will get to spend eternity with you. While I'm here, would you continue that sanctification process, oh God? Would you continue to transform me to look more like your son by the power of the Holy Spirit? Lord, I lay my sins at your feet. I lay them at your feet. Forgive me for my sins. Wash me clean and white as snow. Lord, I approach that day with confidence, knowing one day I'll be with you forever. But if you're here right now and you can't approach that moment with confidence, if there's any unsteadiness in your heart or in your mind, or maybe there is a distinct fear of death because you don't know where your future lies, 
If the Holy Spirit is working on you right now where you sense some need to repent, where you sense some need to change, that's, that's God by the power of the Holy Spirit working in your heart to transform you right now. He wants to save you. He wants you to be part of his family. So whether you're in person here or you're joining us online right now, I would ask you that if you need to surrender or maybe even feel led like, hey, you are a believer, but you've walked away for some time and today's the day you need to rededicate your life to him, I am totally okay with that too. This is a moment where you could surrender or resurrender your life to him. If that's you, I certainly would love to pray with you and for you. If that's you, would you do me a favor and just acknowledge that by raising your hand up real high right where you're at. If that's you, I'll pray for you. I see your hand, sir, and your hand, sir. Are there others here today? Are there others here today? I see your hand over there. Hallelujah. Thank you, ma'am. I see your hand in the back right there too, sir. Thank you, Jesus. If you raised your hand, I want to encourage you as we pray to make your way up here to the front. We have a prayer team that would love to pray with you. There are other, yeah, come on right now. If you come out of your seat, come on up. Give God a little bit of glory, Journey Church. If you raised your hand, come on up right now. Let's celebrate with them. Thank you, ma'am. There are a couple of others. If you're there in the back and you want to come up, come on up, man. You can do it. God bless you. Thank you, Lord. You can come too. Go ahead. Thank you, Lord. God is good. Hey, give God a little glory today, Journey Church. He's, he's still at work. He's still saving. He's still changing lives. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence. Thank you that you still save lives. Father, we love you and we praise you today. We join with those who are coming up for the first time to just say, Jesus, you are, we repeat it one more time, you are the son of God who died on a cross and rose again that we might have life. We put our faith and our hope in you. We confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus, you are the savior of the world. You didn't die just for somebody else, you died for me. And this very moment, I surrender my life to you for the first time or anew. Thanking you for every single day that you give me breath here, Lord Jesus, knowing that one day I will be with you. Lord, would you create a longing in all of our hearts to be with you, but more importantly, just to be with you, but also to bring people there to be with you, Lord Jesus. Father, I pray that you would release an anointing into this place for people to go out there and evangelize, for people to go out in this dark generation that we find ourselves in and be a light in the midst of darkness, that they would be salt and light going out there seeking to share the good news of the gospel with anyone who would listen. And Lord, we pray for that great awakening, that great revival that comes before you're about to return, that we would be a part of it, Lord Jesus, that we would get to witness many, 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 many people come to know you as their Lord and Savior, that, Lord, we would see more baptisms, that as the dark gets darker, that the light would get lighter, Lord Jesus, and we thank you that you brought us here for such a time as this. Lord, our hope is to see our cities transformed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God in our generation. Lord, that means we have a responsibility to get out there and serve you and tell the world about you. Lord, I ask right now that you would empower this congregation to live their lives, to make a difference in the lives of others in Jesus' mighty and glorious name. And everyone says, amen. amen. Would you give God some glory for those?